right, this is the video where I believe I am losing my job because normally I do all the video selections, but this week Mr. Crypto did the selection and he did a fantastic job. I think he needs to select our readings more often. Oh, shower me with praise. I love it. Give me more. Give me more. <laughs> <laughs> I am susceptible to flattery. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am the scheduler crypto. If you are new to this channel, we go heavy into detail into the books that we read. This week, we are covering Of the Coming of John by W.E.B. Du Bois. And if you are down for those sorts of discussions, please consider hitting that subscribe button to join us on the literature adventure. Start off with the publication information here. We will leave a link down in the description below where you can read this for free. Also, you can go to Amazon Classics and this can be read to you for free, which is pretty awesome. This was published in 1903 by W.E.B. Du Bois, and it was part of a collection of stories, and there are 14 chapters, and this is the penultimate chapter and the only fictional piece of The Souls of Black Folk. And it's a pretty interesting work and become super important out of all 14 chapters. Now let's get it out of the way because there's some people out that are like, it's Du Bois. It is actually not Du Bois. It is Du Bois, which I have just recently learned. I have a quote from him in 1939 where he made it clear. This is a quote from Du Bois himself. My name is pronounced in the clear English fashion. Du with a U as in Sue and Bois as in the oi in voice. The accent is on the second syllable. Very clearly here, he is making a distinction for his American heritage. It's kind of like St. Louis, right? We, there, there's words that are pronounced the American way, and, and he's he's identifying with that. Yeah, just like whoever was the genius to throw all the U's out of everything. <laughs> so Du Bois was an American sociologist and civil rights activist. He was the first African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard and was one of the co-founders of the NAACP. And I think that as we see through this writing and most of his writings, he was writing against racism and many of the social problems, civil rights problems that were occurring in our country in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Now we have to give the trigger warning. I think this is more important than any form of spoiler is that there is an assault on a woman and there is usage of the N-word in this story. So if those are things that you cannot handle, this would not be a story for you. There is tragic death as well. Now let's talk about some of the themes that Du Bois experiments with here. One is education. From what I've heard and what I've read of Du Bois, his education was very important to him. And he had a very unique view on it. And I love the way this, this quote from this piece summarizes it. John, she said, does it make everyone unhappy when they study and learn lots of things? He paused and smiled. I'm afraid it does, he said. And John, are you glad you studied? Yes, came the answer, slowly, but positively. Whew. It gives me chills. Yeah. To, gives me chills. That's deep. That's deep. And I think this comes to the root of the entire story and probably the most important of all the themes, the education here, that to... Du Bois education was an opportunity for freedom and it was it was power. And I think throughout the story we see how education will be viewed from two very different social and racial stances. And that segues me into the next theme. The second theme I'm going to bring up is double consciousness, which was kind of coined by Du Bois. He defines it as a internal conflict experienced by subordinated or colonized people in an oppressive society. Originally, double consciousness was specifically the psychological challenge African Americans experienced of always looking at oneself through the eyes of a racist white society and measuring oneself by the means of a nation that looked back in contempt. That's deep. That, I think, sums up kind of everything in the fact that a lot of times black people during this time period, and maybe even today, are don't realize how they are treated until they're actually treated that way and that they're always going to be subjective to what is taught to them by somebody that is not themselves and he's saying that that's wrong and we're not going to be fixed until we get past that so race is a socially constructed category of biological traits that we assign value to as a society and this is speaking to that concept of recognizing you have how you view yourself and then you have how the rest of the white world will look at you and recognizing that and, and having not necessarily the reconciliation, but finding a true identity 
for yourself with all of these masks, these veils that get put onto you, if you will. So one of the ways that I think about this is we don't know who or what we are until somebody else tells us that. When you're a little kid and you look in the mirror, you just see yourself and you don't see yourself as different until someone tells you that. And if you are a, a white person or a black person and you're growing up in a community where everybody looks the same as you, you don't know that you're different than, say, other people. And then as John goes out into life, we'll see in the story that he finally realizes that he is different and he's being treated different as such. And I know that personally, uh, I didn't realize this either, that there was a difference. Uh, you know, I had um, a brother that was adopted and he was black, so it, like it never meant anything to me at all. But when the first time when I got to college, I learned of different languages. I'd never heard another language spoken before. And that was a shocker to me that there is there's differences out there and you don't recognize it until someone else shows it to you. Growing up in a homogenous society, when you leave that, it can be quite shocking, right? Exactly. Exactly. And it can be so jarring that you don't realize that that somebody's looking at you as negatively because you are different because you didn't know you were different. All right. And the last theme that really gets explored in this piece is the color line. Man, this is a really good story is the color line. And Du Bois is quoted as saying the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line in all walks of life. The N word is liable to meet some objection in his presence or some discourteous treatment. And the ties of friendship or memory seldom are strong enough to hold across the color line. So I can be friends with someone. I can be treating someone really well. But as soon as that racism card is played, I'm going to side with the people that I associate with more so than the person on the other side of that color line. I think that's heartbreaking, really, right? It really is. It seems like that it always comes up and people don't mean it to. And it, it, it always comes up so flippantly, too, which I think probably broke his heart even more. It's that idea of, oh, I have a black friend. Such a good story. Let's go yeah. through the plot, and then we'll have our discussion where I've got a couple of prompts to kind of lead us more through a discussion, more so than a direct breakdown, because this piece is something that can be broken down in so many different ways. It has been broken down in so many different ways. I want to talk about it from a place that comes from, from us specifically, more so than any literature or critical analysis, right? Yeah, our personal experiences. So in terms of plot, basically we follow two gentlemen, both named John, both from the same town, who both pursue education. However, one is white and one is black. John Jones is black, and he brings a laugh into the room and is respected for his work by the white community and goes to Wells Institute for his education. John Henderson is white, has a judge as a father, and goes to Princeton, a prestigious school. Now, at school, John Jones struggles with keeping up, focusing, and learns he's going to have to work harder than others to stay enrolled. Years later, he graduates, and the two so happen to attend the same performance in New York. However, John Jones is escorted out due to his skin color. John Jones returns home, and his family members all find he's acting different now that he's educated. He is granted permission to educate his fellow black community. However, he's shut down when he's not promoting racial inferiority for the black folk. Meanwhile, John Henderson sexually assaults John Jones' sister. John Jones seeks vengeance and kills John Henderson. And then it's kind of foreshadowed that he's going to be hung for for the crime of killing a white man at the end of the story. And that's the end of the plot. Yeah, I think that this story only can be really told through a fictionalized version because it's going to be too personal if you get into some of the actual historical stories that mirror this very, very closely. You're going to have some people that get infuriated as opposed to a fictionalized version of it, which which can probably be a little bit more opening. Now, with the opening comment, we have to start out with the disclaimer that we talk about on this channel, literature can be doors, windows, or mirrors. They're doors to invite change into people. They're mirrors to allow us to see ourselves and our experiences in it. And they're windows to see other experiences that we may not be privy to right? So for this discussion, I feel like this is more of a door and a window for for me and crypto here, at least. Yeah, so we're getting to see into other people's lives that we would never get to experience our own. And this is the only way that we're going to be able to experience this. There's through stories, right? And this is this is a mass produced story, if you will. 
All right, so let me let me start with some questions here. What do we think about Du Bois choosing to have them both both of these main characters called John? I think he's trying to show here that people start off the same and equal and color doesn't matter, but as we become more educated, it will become apparent that it does matter to some people and how detrimental that can be to some people and how it can be so helpful to other individuals. And I can see this is also a way to kind of explore, to your point, that double consciousness, right? Where he grew up not knowing he was different, and then we get to start to see he learns how he's different, right? And then through the story, you see that John Jones comes from, you know, a humble background, and John Henderson, his dad's a judge, he's going to be afforded all of these extra perks, but quote that white privilege, and that's going to allow him to propel his life faster, better, easier than John Jones does. So I think this is kind of leading into the small town beginnings, right? So John Henderson goes to Princeton. He comes from privilege, right? His dad is literally the judge. He's literally the one where legal cases are brought to him and he gets to decide what the legal grammar... What's the legal ramifications, which is also representative of the white structure that Du Bois would be talking to, right? Because particularly in 1903, the structure of what the law followed was white by design, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And how the outside sources of the white community are going to influence the the lives and destiny of, of black Americans, well, now, now let's talk about how these communities looked at these individuals, right? Because the narrator is first person plural, right? Which we just covered a rose for Emily. And it was the same thing where it allowed us to kind of pass judgment onto these characters when we, the town, are looking at these two individuals, right? Yes. And when John Jones is described, they the white community, they said he's, they voted him a good boy. Fine plow hand, good in the rice fields, handy everywhere, and always good natured and respectful. So these are all speaking to how he's a good worker. It's speaking to his utility. It's speaking to how useful he is, right? Well, he meets their their expectations, their white expectations of him. So he's okay then. Exactly. And now I'm, when I'm being black- sarcastic there. <laughs> if if my tone didn't get it, that kind of I, I, it makes me mad. Kind of you know that that. Somebody would be so reliant on the community to, you know, see worth in themselves. It, it just makes me angry a little bit. I feel bad for John Jones. And that's part of the brilliant side of using first person plural and exploring this double consciousness, right? They're, yeah. they're assigning this to him. They voted on it, right? And when the black community describes him, remember they said that when he enters into a room, the whole room, you know, just laughs, right? It gives a a character feeling of his personality. So so they're viewing him as a human and as a person, while the white community is viewing him as utility and what he can do for them. Yeah, and that's important to note, I think, through the story of how communities will judge themselves and how outside eyes will judge you. And I dare say that this isn't necessarily irrelevant today. I think it's more relevant than ever today. <laughs> All right, so what do we think about how higher education was portrayed in this story? So I guess for this, I think that the higher education is something that is a burden. And in my mind, it was that it's the old saying that ignorance is bliss, but also that knowledge is power. And we see in the story that John Jones, he was great when he was ignorant, but as he got educated when he returned back home, that higher education it broke him a little bit inside because he got a taste of how the world really is and how it really works. Well, and I don't even think it's that cut and dry, right? Because it was viewed completely different between these two individuals, right? When John Henderson was going to school, we have the quote, it'll make a man of him, said the judge. College is the place. But then when John Jones, to your point, went to school, they warned him, it'll spoil him, ruin him, they said, and they talked as though they knew. Yeah, I guess when you read it, the word ruin and spoil him aren't what you may think they are, and that they mean something different. The fact that it's going to make him uh, feel, 
it's going to be something different to make him feel like he is better than. It's actually going to expose all of the racism to him of how the white community looks at the black community. And this isn't just some magical fictional thing that Du Bois decided to write. I attended a lecture at my school after I had graduated. I went back and there was a lecture happening that I went to. It was free. And this lecturer was talking basically about the poverty line, not even necessarily, you know, a racial line, but the poverty line. And he talked about how when people try to move up in class, when they try to better themselves through education, through a better job, through moving for for a more financially lucrative opportunity, there's this weird phenomenon that people will try to drag you down. Like from a sociology standpoint, people don't want to see other people necessarily rise above out of jealousy. And you see that a little bit here, not only from the the white community saying it'll spoil him, I think even the black community here, it's explored in the story where they talk about how he's different now. They didn't want to see him kind of change himself or rise up in a sense that that by getting the education, he John Jones alienated himself not just from the white community, which he was always going to be alienated from, but by educating himself and trying to rise and bring himself up, he thus alienated himself even from his own community that he grew up with, which is probably one of the most heartbreaking parts of the story. Yeah. And do you think that race is kind of the deciding factor here of why people would pull someone down? In this story... I mean, you said jealousy, but in this story, it's race, not jealousy, right? In this... Well, even his own community doesn't... They they, they think he's different, right? He doesn't act the way he used to. He learned and started to behave differently in college. So yes and no, where race is a big part of it, but even in his own race, they saw a difference too. Yeah. Which which is what makes it so difficult. This this is a really hard piece to read, I feel like, when you really dig into it. Got wrenched what, for sure. <laughs> what do you think about when John Jones's return and he started his segregated school? I feel like that's what Du Bois is trying to do with the whole of the work. And this fictionalized piece out of the 14 chapters is him saying, look, we need to educate the, the black community if we're going to prosper, if we're going to break out of these shackles of the, the control, we need an education. And that there's going to be pushback from our own people against that because we've been so stereotyped that we, we believe what they tell us. That are, are it's going to take are, the education to break that. Are we aligned? Do, do you feel that this... I have a very specific moment in history that I think he was writing for in this piece. Did you pick out yeah. any specific maybe grievance here in this section? Yeah, I, I totally feel like this is Du Bois trying to reference the Atlanta Compromise and what took place there. Okay, so if you didn't know what the Atlanta Compromise was from the wiki... The agreement was that the Southern blacks would work and submit to white political rule, while Southern whites guaranteed that blacks would receive basic education and due process in law. Blacks would not focus their demands on equality, integration, or justice, and Northern whites would fund black educational charities. So this was a compromise, I think pushed mostly by Booker T. Washington, if I remember correctly and read correctly. That basically we will accept some level of inferiority from a structural standpoint with the understanding that in exchange we will be given education because because both Booker T. Washington and Du Bois agreed education was a way forward. Yeah, but Booker T. Washington's like, all right, if we have to basically subject ourselves or humiliate selves or just agree that, yes, we're not as good to get an education, it's worth it. And Du Bois is like, no, 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 we are equal and we still deserve the education. Well, and, and this is going to speak to that third theme that we talked about with the color line, because I think Booker T. Washington probably had a more optimistic view than maybe what Du Bois saw, because Du Bois saw the color line as... You know, when it, when it came to the law, okay, when it came to anything, you could be my friend, the white people could try and help me, we could try to be integrated. But as soon as that racial card was played, nothing crossed the color line, and they would lose every single time. There could be no compromise until absolute equality was reached from his side, because he had a much more 
negative view of the color line. I, I wouldn't even say negative. I think that he had a realistic view because that's literally what happens when segregation takes place and the black schools are not providing the same education as what the white children get in their schools. He, he sure. nailed exactly what would happen and did happen for nearly 60 years. Sure. And when I say pessimistic versus optimistic, I just mean in comparison of these two individuals' yeah. views, right? I, okay. I, yeah, I, completely yeah. agree. I completely agree with you. Yeah. And that's what we saw with, with John Jones in this story. As soon as he started to not promote inferiority and he started to teach about, what was it, like something in France? I can't quite recall. But as soon as he started to talk about equality, immediately the color line card was played. White people came in and shut the school down. Yep, yep. And I think that it's it's both sides here. I mean, it takes two to tango, so to speak. And I think it's both sides. Obviously, I think one side is more at fault than the other for the oppression of the white community on the black community. But the black community believes it, what they're being told. And that's why he sees education as so as important, is to break the notion that we are lesser than, that we are equal, we are the same, and that color does not matter. And I feel like he was trying to lift people up out of that view of this double consciousness view and to say, you are strong, you are your own person, and when it came to kind of particularly Jim Crow era, this double consciousness, this idea that you had to have these two different identities, I think he was trying to reconcile that for people in a way that many people couldn't see. And I think he's trying to reconcile it on both sides as well, because in many of his other works, he talks about how we're both beholden to this just because the black community is treated lesser than and has it far worse off, don't get me wrong, he does say in his other works, if you read it, that the white people suffer just as much in this as well, maybe not just as much, but he says that they're locked into it as well. Both sides are trapped until they both acknowledge it to fix it and then move forward together. Right. Inequality will hurt all, but clearly yeah. the white community benefited vastly compared yeah. to any any grievance that yeah. they may have had right yeah we still see that today in 2020 that's there there is no argument there and right. i mean well you could argue it but I, you don't have a leg to stand on all right so let's talk about what did we think about the ending i think when it comes down to the ending for john henderson and john jones it's very common of what we saw what two people's lives would have been like for the differences of a white man to a black man and how they would have been treated and what decisions they might have made in their lives and that at the end there he he's going to make the choice he does for his family and that John Henderson's going to make that choice because he feels that superiority and and there's even like a highbrow inter in interpretation out there about how this is the same person but if he were white this is his life if they were black this is his life to to what you just described there's a whole way to break it down that way I think one of the ways that I took the ending is John Henderson assaulted a woman, right? The only way John Jones could seek justice in his view and in, in, in their view is through taking it to his own hands because that would not be taken into court probably the same way. I mean, think about it too, how his dad is a judge, right? That would not be taken to court the same way as if a black man were to assault a white woman, right? Completely different. So the only way he could seek justice is through his own hands. And then even when he does, he knows that that twisted, coiled rope is coming from. He knows that he's going to be lynched because no matter what, the color line cannot be broken and the white community will come and make sure that he is hung for his crimes. It is it is the control, the the oppressive structure the white community puts on at this point in time to oppress the black community through denying them education, through denying them justice. Uh, this is so hard as a story. Like this is this is a heartbreaking story. This is a brilliant story. And uh, it's a true story. It's very true. Yeah, I think that for a fictionalized story, there's a lot of merit to it in the early 20th century and in the early 21st century, and that we need to learn from this so we can hopefully realize his dream of breaking those color lines and 
what happens, you know, further with, with Dr. King. Fun fact, he died the day before the I Have a Dream speech. Du Bois did? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know if that's really fun. <laughs> I you know I always tell my students in the different story or different projects and stuff. I was like, you can call them fun facts, but if they're not, then don't make them fun facts. Make them that's realistic a, facts. That's, that's not a fun fact. That is <laughs> not a fun fact. All right, let's move on to our personal ratings. Where normally uh, we give our analytical rating as well as our subjective, just inspectional for fun read rating. So this one's hard for me because I don't know if this just because it's fiction. We can say that I have the personal enjoyment part of it because I think this is something that should be read, even though it is fiction, purely as analytical and teaching of how you can be a better person. And okay. uh, so I'm just going to give it one rating as a solid nine because this is something that I think that everybody should reflect upon in their own lives of how you want to be treated and how you want to treat people. And imagine that you were John. And imagine that your son was John. And I'm not going to tell you which name mm. for the last name. I'm just mm. going to leave it there. Interesting. Interesting. Very, very powerful way to, to put that question. So for me, here, here's my challenge is I said for fun, but, but, there's, but fun means many different things, right? Particularly when it comes to tragedy. Like things suck in a tragedy and catharsis make things better. You can still enjoy a tragedy even though it's not fun, like a comedy, right? Yeah, But just in, in terms of, of a positive, emotional, how into it was I type feeling, I'm going to go with a 9.5. And for analytical purposes, I'm going to give it a 10. Ooh, yeah. So I'm going to round it up because I always round up to a 10. So this is a 10 out of 10 story. Uh, very heartbreaking, but it's very true. And I think you need to read it. I agree. And hopefully uh, I can pick another good uh, <laughs> W.E.B. Du Bois story for us in the future. Good, good. Well, his essays his essays are fair game, too, uh, because this is analyzed as if it were an essay, right? But that's what we do on this channel. So if you yeah. enjoy the literature breakdowns like this where we go heavy into detail, please hit that subscribe button to join us on the journey. We post videos two to three times a week, and we'd love to see you in the future. Ona out. Peace.